Number one, the rate at which water flows out of a pipe in gallons per hour is given by a differential function r of time t. The table below shows the rate as measured every four hours for a 24-hour period. Use a midpoint Riemann sum with three subdivisions of equal length to approximate the integral of 0 to 24 r of t. Well, first of all, I'm going to deal with my units. We know the rate is in gallons per hour, and it's asking us to take the integral. So I know that when we take the integral, the rate is going to drop out. So my final answer is going to be gallons. It's going to tell me how many, how much water has flown out of the pipe. All right, so now we're going to use a midpoint Riemann sum. Three subdivisions. So I know that I'm going to be going from 0 to 24. Get myself not crooked here. 0 to 24, and if I need three subdivisions, 24 minus 0 is 24 divided by 3. I'm going to go by 8. So 8, 16, 24, I've got my subdivisions. All right, so now um, since we are going by equal subdivisions, since I'm going by 8s, I can put an 8 on the outside, and then we want a midpoint sum. So between 0 and 8, the midpoint would be 4. So my y value there would be, or my r value there would be 9.4. And then between 8 and 16, 12 is my midpoint, so plus 10.4 would be my R value. And then between 16 and 24, 20 would be my midpoint, so 10.8 would be my R value. And if I just calculate that out, that will be 244.8, and we've already established that our units will be gallons. Okay, number two, find the average value of sine cubed x on the interval pi over 2 to 2 pi over 3. Keywords here are average value, so I know I need to do 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b. So here we go. So I'm going to do 1 over 2 pi over 3 minus pi over 2, and then times the integral from pi over 2 to 2 pi over 3 of my function, and my function happens to be sine cubed x dx. And then from here, we can let math 9 do all the work for us. The caution I'm going to say on this one, when you plug this in for your function, just make sure it needs to be sine x. The cube does not go in parentheses with it. It goes on the outside. And you can either put parentheses, or I think if you don't put parentheses, it works out all right. And when you do that, you're going to get 0 0.875 as your answer. Number three, do the following limits exist? Explain why or why not. So way back to chapter one, I believe, for this one. Remember, for a limit to exist, the limit from the left has to equal the limit from the right. So I'm going to write the limit as x approaches c from the left must equal the limit as x approaches c from the right. We really don't care what's happening at that point. So if we're finding the limit as x approaches 0, so here's 0 right here. As I'm coming in from the left, the y value that I am approaching is 2. So the limit as x approaches 0 from the left would equal 2. And as I'm coming in from the right, I'm approaching also a y value of 2, so my limit as x approaches 0 from the right side is also equal to, so it said do the following limits exist? Um, I'm going to say on this one, yes, and I'm just going to say it's because the limit as x approaches 0 is actually 2. The limit from the left does equal the limit from the right. We do not care that there's a hole happening there, we just care what's happening from either side. Okay, the limit as x approaches 2. So let's see what's happening as we approach from the left side. So as I approach 2, from the left side, I'm actually coming in right here, and I'm going to stop at 2. And then if I find the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side, as I'm coming in from the right, I'm way down here at 1. Those limits do not equal each other, so I'm going to say no, the limit does not exist. And when it says to explain why not, it's because the limit as x approaches 2 from the left does not equal the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Number four, if f of x equals the integral from 4 to 2x of 5 over the cube root of 2x, 2 cu t cubed plus 1 dt, then f prime of 1 is equal to what? All right, please notice that they are asking us to take the derivative of an integral. And if you're asking for take, to take the derivative of an, of an integral, that would be the second fundamental theorem of calculus, which pretty much states that the derivative and the integral cancel each other out. So I'm first of all just going to find f prime of x. So again, what's going to happen? The integral and the derivative cancel each other out. However, we do need to change our variables. So we're going to, wherever we see a t, we're going to put a 2x. So this will be 2x cubed plus 1. And then I do have to multiply by the derivative of the 2x because we do have to um, use the chain rule on this one. Okay, so this will equal 10 over 
the cube root, 2x cubed will actually be 8x cubed plus 1 because both the 2 and the x get um, multiplied. And then they asked us to find the derivative at 1. So if we're finding the derivative at 1, we're just now going to plug in 1 for our x value. And when we do that, we'll end up with 10 over the square root of 9, which reduces to 10 thirds. Okay, number 5. The function f has first derivative given by f prime x equals 1 plus e to the 2x minus x squared. What is the x coordinate of the inflection point of the graph of x? So if I'm talking about an inflection point, I need to know information about f double prime. And there's a couple different ways to do this. I'm going to do this the way that I would suggest first. If this is a calculator problem, I'm going to actually draw a picture of f prime. And if I draw a picture of f prime, we get to use our graphing calculator to do that. I get something that looks like that. Okay, and if I want a point of inflection, I would like to do an f double prime chart. Please keep in mind that this is f prime. If I want to go from f prime to f double prime, I'm going to be looking at the slopes. So if I'm looking at the slopes, notice the slopes are positive until I get to this spot right here. And if I find that spot, I can use a maximum. Um, I found that it was at one. So I notice the slopes are positive until I get to x equals one, and then they're negative after that. And so um, once I do that, I can notice that at x equals one, there is a point of inflection. Okay, another way, I might not work it out the whole way. We could actually take the derivative of this. This would be f double prime is equal to, um, the derivative of one is just zero. The derivative of e to the two x minus x squared would be e to the two x minus x squared times the derivative of the two minus x squared, which would be two minus two x. And then from here, um, we would set our derivative equal to zero. And then e is never going to equal zero, so I really don't care about that one. I'd set two minus two x is equal to zero. That's happening at x equals one. And then if I did my f double prime chart, putting one on it, if I plugged, and e is always going to be a positive number, so if I plugged in zero into the second part of the second derivative, I'd get a positive number. And if I plugged in something bigger than one, I would get a negative number. Notice it gets us to the same spot. I would definitely suggest if you have your calculator to just use this method because sometimes taking the um, derivative is a little bit tedious.